Hi and welcome to Just The Job, New Zealand's careers program which gives you a behind the scenes insight into a huge range of exciting career opportunities. This week we've got a special program looking at three new possibilities just for you. First up, we're here at New Zealand's largest supermarket as we join RP who's discovering what's involved in a career in retail meat. Then we head to New Zealand's only glass bottle making factory in Penrose as Jake looks at starting a career in mechanical engineering. And to round off today's program, we're in Christchurch as Tony finds out about careers in the expanding heating, ventilation and air conditioning industry. So let's get started and join RP as he takes a look behind the scenes here and discovers the skills required in retail meat. Introducing RP to the job is Blake Angove. RP. Hey. Blake, formerly a qualified butcher for foodstuff supermarkets, supports all their apprentices through training organisation Competence. To be a good butcher, you need to be thick-skinned. Um, you know, it's, it's not a workplace for the faint-hearted. Um, you need to be reasonably strong. You know, you're carrying around carcasses. You're, you know, you're starting early as well. Any time from sort of four to sort of six is the, probably the general starting time, but um, certainly rewarding. First, RP gets a tour around. All right, RP, well, this is the butchery. Oh, yes. This is the Inwards Goods area. So what happens is basically all your carcasses, all your chicken boxes, everything comes in through this back door. Oh, yeah. So once it's come out of the Inwards Goods area, then basically it's going to come out onto rails, and this is the prep area. For example, this is the area where they bone beef. Yep. Breaking lambs down this area. Basically what the aim is, is to get the cabinet full before the shop opens. While many might be cooking their breakfast bacon, a butchery is at its busiest. So it's a good time to see how a well-organised butchery works. So how do I get started? How do you get started? Well, there's all sorts of jobs you could be doing. Yep. You could be cutting something up like a ribeye, scotch steak. But unfortunately, this is quite a precious cut, one of the most expensive cuts. So the sort of tasks that you'd be doing to start with would be making mints, yep. um, filling up the pet food, things like that. They seem a little bit tedious, but the reality is you do have to start at the bottom, just like yep. any career. If you say, oh, how much training do you have to take to be able to do a cut like that? Normally about three years on the knives. Oh, yeah. So it sounds like a lot of time, but there's a lot of things to learn. There's four main species that we break down in a butchery. Yep. Beef, lamb, pork and chicken. OK, so are there any princesses present here today? Um, there's one called Jack, actually. Do you want to go meet him? Yes, please. Awesome. Jack, how you doing, man? A job for new apprentices is making some of the value-added products for the gourmet bar. Okay, so These are chicken mignons, and Jack, who is nearing the end of his apprenticeship, is showing Arpi what's yep. required. You make it up as a butterfly looking, see? Yep. Now you go have a streak of bacons, the fat side out, yeah, that one. You, you roll it around it. Jack hails from Kurda Shirak. When he arrived, he had no English, but his good attitude and ability to learn fast has been impressive. He's looking at a very successful career as a butcher. I never thought I was going to be a butcher until I got a part-time job. I never ever thought I was going to stick around in the butcheries uh, or meat industries. Yeah, I got the offer once I convinced my boss to give me opportunity to be on printers. Okay, so what is it that you like most about being a butcher? I'm 100% positive with what I'm doing, and I'm 100% happier with it. This is something, it's like a challenging, you, it's, it's, it's all fun and game, but in the meantime, it's a dangerous job, so... Yeah. Good knife skills with a big eye on safety is important. Clean and accurate cuts make the product look good, and they also minimise waste. Yeah, so hygiene's important. Um, what we've got to remember is that what we're preparing is what people are eating, um, so it's, it's critical. Um, you've got different types of meats in there as well, so we all know the dangers of chicken. So cross-contamination comes into it. Um, but personal hygiene as well. Um, again, you know, we're handling food that people are going to be consuming, so making sure that, that we're looking after ourselves in a hygienic way. Sticking and stacking is a never-ending job. OK, so I hear that you've uh, won an award. Uh, yeah, I did a competition called Butcher's Princess of the Year. I won overall. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. Also collecting an award was Abigail Lane, who took out the Young Butcher of the Year. Both will be heading to the UK, where New Zealand's Sharp Blacks butchering team have their next competition. It's between the Kiwis, Britain and Australia, and he'll see some of the best knife skills in the world. Well, it's already been a busy morning for RP, and on the dot of 11, the day's delivery arrives. The carcasses head straight from the truck to the near-freezing point chiller. From a personal point of view, I think um, the physical side of it is, is um, really enjoyable. Um, and also just the camaraderie, working with a, in a team environment. 
Uh, most people enjoy a good laugh in there. They work hard, but certainly um, butchers know how to have a bit of fun. Alrighty, here we go. Okay, so this is a hind quarter of beef arpy. Yep. Okay. So basically that means it's the, the back of the animal. Okay, so you've got the shin through here. Okay. Then you've got the inner leg, which is known as the top side. Yep. You use that for casserole type steaks and what have you. And then your silver side, which is the outside of the leg. Yep. Okay. You then move down into the rump area, which is basically through here. So it's basically like the back side of the animal, the buttocks. Okay, and then you're moving down into your expensive cuts. So you've got things like eye fillet, which you would have heard of, which runs down through the middle of here. Yep. Okay, so that's your most expensive cut. Next job, making mints. Naylor, a pack and save recent recruit, is showing RP how. And before you lift it, use your knee. Yep. Naylor is hoping to become an apprentice soon. Instead of using your arms to pick it up. They are, what made you want to be a butcher in the first place? Well, what, what inspired me was um, the teamwork and effort that goes into making the meat. The beef has to be run through the machine three times before it's ready for the shelves. That ensures there's a refined and consistent quality. Customer service is, is an, another major part of, of being a butcher. Um, you're interacting with customers. Um, they expect good service, so, you know, certainly being friendly, um, open and honest with your customer is critical. For a qualified butcher, what cuts the mustard most is taking a carcass of beef and swiftly and deftly breaking it down into its component parts. Once you're qualified as a, um, as a butcher, after you've done your apprenticeship, there's plenty of options. And if you're working in a supermarket, for example, you can go into, into management. Um, there's plenty of butchers that own stalls. You could go into tutoring of apprentices. There's all sorts of different career opportunities. It's been a big day, so is Arpy sharp enough to be a butcher? Look at that, Arpy, eh? Second time, and look at that, pretty awesome. Yes, yeah, so Arpy's done exceptionally well. Um, he's got his hands dirty, he's got amongst it. Um, I really wish him well in his future employment. I think he'll be an asset to any team. Yeah, so in future's time, I'd really like to be an apprentice so I can be a butcher and pursue my career and slice up meat like they do. <laughs> There are no specific entry requirements, but you need to demonstrate a keen interest in butchery and secure a job with a butcher first. The Level 4 Certificate Program focuses on the key skills required to work in a retail butchery. You learn on the job together with block course attendance. Competence manages all New Zealand retail meat apprenticeships. You have to work in a butchery to do an apprenticeship. A growing population means job prospects are good. Hey, well done, Api. After the break, we're off to a hugely productive glass-making factory as Jake checks out a career in mechanical engineering. Don't go away. Welcome back to Just The Job. Ever wondered how these glass jars and bottles are made? Well, Jake's about to find out as he checks out a career in mechanical engineering. Hi, I'm Jake Ehaka, and I'm here today at OI New Zealand to have a look at mechanical engineering and the glass-making industry. Jake is joining the team at OI New Zealand, one of 79 glassmaking plants based in 21 countries around the world. It's New Zealand's only glassmaker and its six production lines run 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Hi, I'm Jake. Hey Jake, my name's Mohammed. Um, welcome to OI Glass New Zealand. Uh, I've got plenty to show you, so uh, let's get you signed in, eh? See you guys. Mohammed Hafiz is a line manager at OI New Zealand. First, there's an induction and safety briefing, and then he joins Muhammad for a tour around the factory. Uh, the machines can be um, very complicated itself. Um, there's a lot of uh, lot of things to learn uh, mechanically and uh, also electrically, um, and um, you know put it all together to make a glass bottle. Working here is unique. Staff have to be skilled in both mechanical engineering and glass making. Jake's first lesson is to find out how glass is made. Uh, what raw materials do you use? All right, the raw materials we have is sand, soda ash, and uh, limestone, and um, coloured. We call it coloured, but this is all recycled glass that we get back from the uh, consumers out there. More than half the raw material used to make the glass is recycled. The material is elevated into batch hoppers, which supply the furnace. It goes from the hoppers into the furnace where it's melted at 1600 degrees Celsius to create molten glass. The molten glass then goes into an orifice ring, then cut into sections called gobs. The gobs are then loaded into the blank side of the machine where it's pressed or blown into a parison, which is a miniature version of what the bottle will look like when it's completed. The parison is then moved over to the mould side of the machine, where it's blown into its final form, whether it be a jar, beer bottle or wine bottle. 
gobs, blanks and moulds, there's a lot of new names for Jake to get his head around. And his first job has another new name, a process called mopping. One of the things is just to lubricate the actual gear because um, it does run quite hot, so you've got to keep it to a, uh, get it down to a certain temperature. Uh, we're lubricating with um, special oil that we get. Uh, it's, um, it's got a high graphite content, um, which um, keeps it nice and friction-free on the blanks. Yeah, every hour we take bottles off the line. We'll take um, uh, a sample set every hour and then we'll um, check through the sample set for defects, uh, visual defects, um, anything that will cause uh, um, issues with the customers, consumers and so on. And anything that's found, we um, uh, rectify the fault before we um, uh, put it back into a layer. The company produce hundreds of different bottles and each bottle design has its own mould. The slightest wear in a mould will produce a fault in a bottle. So this huge workshop is mostly dedicated to maintaining moulds. Jake is watching mould shop fitter Mark Robinson spray well. Metal particles are sprayed onto a damaged part and that builds up a new surface. The area is then very carefully filed and ground back to a very precise dimension. You place the two halves of the mould together. Okay. You use this chain clamp to keep them nice and tight. Yep. Place it down on here. Get the light in behind it so you can see what you're doing. Then you use this tool here to buff out the welds and make the cavity smooth. So if you want to have a go at that. Uh, basically, uh, practice makes perfect when it comes to repairing molds. Um, the more you do it, the, the more you'll get the hang of it. Uh, you have to be very good with your hands. Um, you have to have a good eyesight. Uh, you have to be very precise with your tools. Okay, that looks good. Apprentice Scott Holden has followed his brother into the company and is enjoying the training. Yeah, it's been so cool. Learned heaps of new things. Learned how to machine, weld, uh, maintenance. Two Competenza account managers supervise apprentices. Adrian Don looks after the glass side, while Gerard Robbins looks after the mechanical side. Apprentices need to understand and know about the glass industry combined with the mechanical engineering, which is where they end up with two qualifications. The apprentices are not employed by OI New Zealand, but by a trust. ATNZ is a trust, non-profitable charitable trust, whereabouts we employ the apprentices directly and we host them or second them out to a company like OI Glass. It's a benefit for all because they're being paid as they're learning and they're coming out with a qualification at the end that is recognised worldwide. Yeah. Neil Ollerton is the company yeah. training manager. Yeah. So what I thought we'd do today is actually revise those defects. So if you guys start with that one, and you guys can start with that one. Well, the sort of people who have succeeded in this area have, have spent some, time, some part of the youth tinkering with things, taking things apart, putting them back together again. It's people who, who want to look and know how things work. There's opportunities to, to work internationally. Uh, we have our ex-apprentices who worked on teams uh, which have, have travelled all over Asia Pacific fixing machines. Jake's now learning about worn plungers. So this is the damaged plunger with a dent on the corner. A plunger is the mould for the screw top area. It has to be reprofiled on the lathe. It is a fantastic, interesting place to work. You know, the process is fascinating. Um, the engineering behind the process is fascinating. And it's great to see the things that the people we've worked and trained actually on the show, out on the shelves in New Zealand. Safety is number one for our wine glass. Um, we pride ourselves on our safety record. You're working with 1,600 degrees in the furnace, and on the machines you could be working up to 800 degrees with the bottles itself. Uh, we're using the right protective gear. Glass making has been around for centuries. Um, it's come a long way in the industry with the innovation we've already had, but we're always uh, continuously looking for new ways of um, improving our processes and uh, making a perfect bottle. Um, Jake's shown a lot of interest uh, in the industry. Um, he's uh, very keen to learn and uh, he's definitely got the right attitude, so I think he's got a long way to go. Yeah, I've um, really enjoyed my visit. It was a good look into the industry. There's a lot to learn, but I think I wouldn't mind giving it a crack. The ATNZ Trust is New Zealand's largest employer of mechanical engineering apprentices. Competenz manages and delivers the ATNZ Apprentice Program. An apprenticeship at OI New Zealand will deliver qualifications in both mechanical engineering and glass. There's a shortage of people in the role, so the chances of getting a job are good.
Hey, well done, Jake. We're heading to Christchurch in just a moment, but first, here's Hannah from Careers New Zealand. Thanks, Clinton. Good skilled mechanical engineers are much in demand and is a great career option too, with lots of career advancement opportunities. Everyone has skills, but how well do you know your skills? Find out at careers.govt.nz. Thanks, Hannah. After the break, we're heading to Christchurch, looking at a great career option in heating, ventilation and air conditioning. Don't go away. You're watching Just The Job, the program that has featured over 200 careers to date. Here's another career option. Let's join Tony as he discovers what it takes to have a successful career in the heating, ventilation and air conditioning industry. Hi, I'm Tony Carrick. I'm 19 years old. I'm from Christchurch and today I'm going to be finding out about the heating and ventilation industry. Tony is joining the team at David Brown Contracting in Christchurch, a large heating and ventilation company who take on work all over the South Island. Tim Brown is the manager of the company. So air conditioning and ventilation is installed from houses, simply houses, right through to swimming pools, schools, prisons, hospitals, hotels. Basically we're trying to maintain an air quality inside those commercial buildings and we're trying to heat and cool the space via pipes and pipe work and, and air down ducting and, and that sort of thing. Okay, so uh, this is the layout of the site at the Botanical Gardens. Tony's looking at the plans for an earthquake rebuild project in the famous Christchurch Botanic Gardens. Project very, very special case, there's a lot of big projects coming up, there's new police stations and justice precincts and sports stadiums and there's a real shortage of uh, staff at the moment. The company have the contract for all the new ventilation systems in the Botanic Gardens glasshouse and cafe area. Here we are at Botanical Gardens, Tony. Um, obviously we lost the building in the earthquake and they've rebuilt the new building. Up here is the new heating and cooling pipe work. The pipe work goes back down into the boiler house over there. So that's 80 degree water through the steel pipes, that's why it's in steel. And the green pipe is only artesian water, so that's out of the ground. Alright Tony, we'll go into the boiler house here where obviously the hot water is generated. Here's a bit of pipe work here. As you can see, some lagging's been put on this bit down the bottom here, yep. so very similar to this. I want you to put on a bit of lagging from here up just under that welding joint just there. The kind of stuff we're looking for are energetic, conscientious people who take time and have pride in their work, um, like to learn new things. Yep. It's hard work. You're up scaffolds, you're on ladders, you're working with a range of tools, battery drills, angle grinders, pot riveters. Put some tape down there. Nice tight finish just like that, keeping the gap as small as possible obviously. So we need um, key guys that are keen to learn and are hard working. And that's pretty good work too. I like the variety. Um, one minute you can be on a construction site putting in pipe work, next minute you can be on the top of a 20 storey building putting in some ducting, next thing you could be in a basement doing all sorts of stuff. So you get to travel around, go to different construction sites right through the South Island, making ducting, making pipe work to on site to installing ductwork and installing pipe work. There's a really good variety of work you could do in this industry. Phil Metakingi is in his third year of apprenticeship. He's showing Tony how to use the threading machine. Do you feel it was a good decision doing your apprenticeship? Oh, definitely the best decision of my, of my life is, um, yeah, yeah, just to get those qualifications. Um, it, it, it just sets you up uh, in a better position for, for, for later on in life. Phil's progress as an apprentice is being checked out today. Matthew Robinson from Competence is visiting, and Phil will graduate in just a few more weeks. Qualifications are very powerful, they're recognised all throughout the country, um, and for later on after finishing your apprenticeship you can move into supervision work or uh, with management or go down more of a technical path. The installation of ducting, which conducts either hot or cold air around a building, is a big part of the job. When you take this bit of galvanised sheet metal, put it on top of here, line it up with the holes and put some pot rivets in. Ducting is a huge part of the industry. Every building, every building needs ventilation, every building needs ducting. Every building has got to either bring air in to warm the space up or remove excess air out just for an air changeover for building quality. You've got to make sure you have nice, clean, fresh air. Back at the company workshop, the David Brown staff are fabricating a new ducting product that performs well in earthquakes. So we've tried to start using a new product called Cool Duct, which is a lightweight ducting. Um, it's poly panel sheets and you glue them together and you put them in ceiling spaces. In lieu of sheet metal, it's lighter, it's easier to use and it makes the, um, the users down below, the office workers, feel more comfortable in that environment knowing that it's not going to fall down on your head yet. It's a lot lighter and a lot cleaner. Clive, I'd like to introduce you to Tony. Hi, Tony, this is Clive. Maintenance of existing systems is a big part of the job. 
maintenance engineer Clive Wardoff is taking Tony out to a brand new installation at a local aquatic centre. The Selwyn Aquatic Centre opened recently and has very sophisticated energy saving systems for both ventilation and pool water heating. It's all completely state of the art technology. For heat recovery systems, it's, it's really the best there is at the moment. It's all digital pulse and computer pulses, and um, you've got to know your way around the computer, you've got to know your way around electricity, and you've got to know what the mechanical plant should be doing mechanically, what it physically does. Uh, I mean, temperature changes, pump changes, valve changes, flow rates. You've got to be able to absorb all this and use it to make its optimum efficiency for working. A heat recovery system takes warm air from inside the building and uses it to warm the fresh air entering. Outside on an upper level, a heat pump system is employed for heating the pool water. For Tony, it's been quite an eye-opener. There's so many areas to eventually specialise in. I think it's a fantastic industry. I just uh, think there's so much variety. My guys are really happy. Uh, there's plenty to do. There's heaps of opportunity. You can earn some really good money in this industry. Um, you set yourself some challenges and goals every week. I think it's really good. OK, Tony's done really well today. He's taken a really positive attitude to this industry. He's learned things quickly. He's adapted himself. He's worked well with others nicely. I think Tony's going to make it really well in this industry. I really enjoyed working here over the last few days. It seems like it's a lot of hard work and there's a lot to learn. There's a Level 4 National Certificate in Heating, Ventilating and Air Conditioning, and Competence will assist you to complete your apprenticeship. There are no specific entry requirements, but NCEA English and Maths is recommended, and you should take the opportunities your school offers to do work experience programs such as Gateway. You earn and learn on the job. New Zealand is experiencing a trades shortage, so there are huge opportunities for skilled tradesmen, particularly in Auckland and Christchurch. To find out more about the training opportunities and careers from this week's show, plus information about all the careers we feature in this series, visit our program website, tvnz.co.nz slash justthejob, or simply Google Just The Job. So best of luck, and I'll see you again next week. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.